a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm the token neuroscientist in the theory session, and in fact, my lab is very much interested in the theory of deep learning. But uh, after talking with Ali yesterday, I decided I needed to give somewhat of a meta talk. Um, how do I click? Oh, here. Great. And so, so as an introduction to my talk, I want to talk about a model that I find incredibly beautiful. So this is out of David Mackay's book, the late David Mackay. Um, it's a question about evolution. So there's an old question of how interesting our brain could be. Now, should we believe that our brain and our deep learning algorithms, if we have them in our brain, um, that that is very simple? Or can we believe that it's uh, rather sophisticated? And um, it all boils down to, at some level, how we should think about evolution. And uh, you can say, how many bits can we acquire in the about four million years since we were apes? And that's a question that neuroscientists have, uh, or like a question that scientists have thought about for a very long time. And there's a naive answer, which is, well, it's about 400,000 uh, bits because we can only get about one bit per, uh, per generation. And uh, in Mackay's book, there's a beautiful treatment of that. So he comes up with the simplest model that you could possibly have for evolution, which is simply that we have fitness, which is the sum of all the bits. Every bit, well, our DNA, well, we just have... Uh, one, uh, two different nucleotides at each place. One of them is right, the other one is wrong. We don't know which is right in the beginning, and therefore we can say the fitness is the sum of all of them, and we basically ask which proportion of them we have right, which is the fitness function. Now, here we have a very simple version, and, and of course, this is linear. In reality, this would be nonlinear, and that would take longer, but like, let's, let's get at the essence of this. Um, uh, how does evolution work? Uh, you randomly flip a bit, or like multiple of them, or you flip a certain proportion of bits, and then uh, the, gener the generation that we currently have makes babies, and then half of them uh, are eliminated, and the, the other half goes to the next, uh, next, direction, uh, next generation. And it reaches uh, perfect performance in that case in about 2G generations. G is the length of the genome that we have. Okay, that is the one bit per generation calculation. And it's, it's somewhat complicated. You have to, uh, to uh, early on flip lots of bits per generation, and then you have to play a temperature game where you flip less and less. But this assumes non-sexual reproduction. No, it's, it's a very simple model. Let's make it slightly more complicated. And that's what David did in this book. And this is, it's a shame that in biology it's not discussed. I think it's one of the most beautiful findings in biology of all times. Let's say we have crossovers instead. So what we have is we have a large population. We start with an infinite-sized population in the beginning. Um, every, new, every kid in the new generation inherits half of the bits from each of its two parents. And the better half survives just as in the same case. In that case, we reach the perfect, uh, we reach the perfect genome in pi over square root of 2 pi plus 2 times square root of g generations on average. <laughs> now, why is this awesome? The first thing is it's pi day, and I'm irrationally excited about it. <laughs> the, the second one is, uh, look, we are square root of g faster. And that means that evolution can actually learn much more about the class of problems that we can solve. And that means that we can, if we assume that on, on average there were about a million people, it means that our algorithm that we use might be in fact a thousand more clever relative to the algorithms of the apes than if we assume simple-minded algorithms. So, um, now uh, let me say one more thing. The other reason why this is so cool is uh, because it describes lots of data. Everything, every living thing on this planet laterally exchanges information. The bacteria do it, all the mammals do it. It seems so expensive, you know, like there's two genders and all that. No, it gives you such a dramatic advantage at learning speed of, uh, in evolution that it's absolutely a trade-off that biology has to make. Okay, so, now what, what should we take from that? In a way, we should expect that the algorithms that, uh, that uh, nature uses should have good sample complexity. And it should have good generalization properties. 
And evolution has a lot of bits to figure out those things. Now, let me briefly summarize the paper we wrote about neuroscience. It's been discussed so much it's a bit of a cliche by now. But um, um, neuroscience needs principles. And at some level, ideas that come from evolution is one of the ways how we obtain principles. And um, uh, to show how much we needed it, we took a very simple model system. This is a microprocessor 6502 that, uh, that, uh, that is uh, it's historical. And we know exactly how to build those. In fact, we did build them. And so we can meaningfully describe to people how we built them. And there's principles, and we can therefore, and we understand how they work. What we did then is we tried if we can figure out how a microprocessor works without using theoretical insights, without using insights. And so we did, in a way, what neuroscientists do when they study brains. So what we did is we did lots of experiments, and I don't want to go through the various details, that were basically theory-free neuroscience on a microprocessor, and we learned preciously little about it. So, now, I'm sure everyone in this room is happy. You're mostly deep learning specialists. And therefore, a lot of people believe that uh, these worries don't apply so much. So let's see if this is true. So here's my meta model of deep learning research. And it's an evolutionary model of deep learning research. What is it that people do? A lot of things that people do is the following. I take an algorithm. I get some intuition, and I add something to the algorithm. You know? Like I add skip connections. I add uh, batch normalization. I, I have good reasons to add those things. So I do this one thing, totally makes in Europe's paper. The alternative is uh, we do crossover. I take someone's algorithm. It's a good algorithm. I take someone else's algorithm. It's also a good algorithm. They're the two leading examples in that field, and I, and I combine them. And so uh, that gives me the crossover. And so I'm arguing that deep learning follows exactly the same path as, uh, as evolution in biology. Um, now, what are the evolved recipes of that? No, everything must be differentiable, obviously. Backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent, and so forth. Uh, probably the majority of people use most of them in most cases. We also know that our system shouldn't be too big, and that's actually the equivalent of the appendix. You know? Like uh, someone came up with the idea that your network shouldn't be too big, and it takes a really long time until evolution gets rid of these leftovers. So what we have is we have this huge set of evolved, uh, evolved recipes. The question is, to which level do, are we moving into science? So I was delighted in this session about the theoretical insights that we saw. It really warmed my heart to hear about them here. So, uh, but first the good news, as n of the number of deep learning researchers goes to infinity, <laughs> we gain square root of the number of uh, PyTorch lines of bits per generation. So, so in the end, as long as we write really, really long uh, codes for a deep learning system, we should be doing really well. Um, but in reality, look, if we think about it from a scientific perspective, we expect something like that. Now, we have underlying principles, the things that we really believe are the essence of it. And then we have implementation, we get performance. And these are the things that we should intuitions about, that we argue about. And, um, and the interesting thing is it, it forces deep learning into a similar problem that we have in neuroscience, which is you have evolved deep learning recipes and what you want to do is find out what are the underlying principles. But like all these things that we have here, this list here, this is all good. But what is it about the world? What is it, what is it about the set of problems that we want to solve that makes this list be a good list? Well, I don't know. But like this is at some level what we have to get towards to make deep learning really scientifically based. And uh, because ultimately, look, this is what I'd like to have. I want to explain to an algorithm what I believe to the world, and it's, it should like, basically compile an algorithm to me that works for this kind of a world. OK, now I want to make one step back, uh, go one step back and, and argue that a certain kind of understanding is probably impossible. So um, what we have is we have that the algorithm and the data that we put into it ultimately give us the trained network. And, um, I want to briefly take a detour through neuroscience and then bring that back right to deep learning, which is um, 
what is, uh, there's arguably two goals of, uh, of computational systems neuroscience. At least, this is a definition of understanding that a lot of people in the field use. So let's take the two parts of the definition of understanding. The first one is, once we understand how the brain works, we must be able to write that into a nice book that I can give you, that I can guide you through, that we can walk through, maybe through one term. And it must be understandable by humans. That's demand A. Demand B is if I give you that book and you read all of it and you implement it, it should actually work. And in the naive view of this, this is all that we need. There is no role for external data. We want to describe how the brain computes, which is at some level we want to understand the weight dump of Alex. Now. Um, so let's, let's, let's operationally define those two pieces. The first one, understandable, we can just say, well, it's, if it has to be roughly book size, this must be like order of a megabit. And the second one is, if we say it needs to work, well, what does work mean? I demand that if I understand how the human brain works, that it does human type things about as good as people do it. The world record of, of learning by heart digits of pi, again, it's pi day, uh, is 110,000 di uh, digits. That, that guy basically spends a day going through the digits of pi, commits that to memory, and therefore it's part of its brain. If we have a satisfactory understanding of that person's brain, uh, all that information must be there, therefore it can't be more compressible than, say, log 2 of 110,000. Um, but also, it must be able to categorize objects, produce speech, dance, and all those things at human level. And now we conjecture, and this is work with uh, Tim Lillicrop, that that will be impossible to commit to, to compress to something that is of the size that a human can understand, which in a way makes a standard view of thinking about what it means, one of the views of what it means to understand brains impossible. So, if the compressibility argument is correct, we can't understand the resulting algorithm after training. The best we can, uh, we can do is basically understand the recipe, so maybe the principles that give rise to it. And um, back, uh, uh, back to the, uh, back to the, actually, let me stay here for one more second. And I think this argument applies to deep learning as well. I want to conjecture here that we will never understand how a system that does ImageNet really works. We can find internal units that are correlated with something, sure. But at some level, if our demand is that we understand it well enough that we can produce it by producing our understanding, it will never be possible. And uh, here, uh, we cannot hope to find uh, deep learning recipes in brains. We can at best look for principles. There's no reason why any set of the recipes that people can come up with should be in the, in the human brain. It should be the underlying, what is necessary to get good at learning, not a specific, this is one thing that kind of works in conjunction with these other 15 things. Okay, and I just want to, this is the end of my talk, I would just want to, uh, to plug two posters because I didn't tell you about our research on why deep learning works, but uh, there's a great poster by Ruzbi Fahudi who asks which functions can be computed on trees. And I should also mention David Rolnick's poster, which asks how uh, about the class of functions that neural networks can, uh, can implement, basically counting how many linear regions there are. And with that, I want to thank everyone for your attention. running um, 15 minutes late, so let's just take a five-minute break and then reconvene.